when you're talking to people and trying to lead them to the Lord, you have to really take a number to start by maybe talking about a person has a soul and that there is a God, not just dive into the four spiritual laws. God loves you and has a wonderful plan for your life, which was my experience prior. But now in the U.S., things have changed so much that we really need to be creation evangelist because the whole society has moved so far that if you use the four spiritual laws as I did on campus one time many years ago a young man said well I'm a science major and um, I said I'm a math major but I have no no belief in what you're telling me because science says this, 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 and this. Well, at that time, I had no answer. And I was ineffective in witnessing because it is, through the educational system, it's so easy to say, it's all in your head. You look at the sunset and you see God's glory, but I look at it <clears throat> and it's just a matter of sun rays and bending of light and the patterns and on and on. It's all in your head. It's all in your mind. There's no empirical evidence. Tonight, I'm going to give you empirical evidence that you really need to know because our society has lost this. It says in, in Psalm 19, you know, the, the uh, heavens the, declare the glory of God. Okay, well, how has that happened? How does that happen? Well, it's actually through science, but it's been so twisted and manipulated that the truth is not getting through. Um, also, in 1 Timothy 4, verse 1, says, in the last days, or in the latter days, some will depart from the faith, paying heed to seducing spirits and who can finish it? Teaching of demons. Doctrines of demons. What are the doctrines of demons in our society? Anybody? There's no God. God is dead. What? <laughs> Speak up. They will say there's no God. God is dead. What's behind that? Philosophy. <clears throat> the doctrine of demons of. Huh? Philosophy? It, it, what is philosophy sitting on? Humanism. Huh? Humanism. <laughs> So-called knowledge. Humanism. Science. That, okay, it, he's getting very close. Science. <laughs> science. Science. But science has been redefined in recent times. When I was growing up, the definition of science is following and researching the facts no matter where it leads. Finding the truth no matter where it leads. Mm -hmm. The new definition of science is scientific inquiry following naturalistic methods. Now, if you catch the subtlety of the change, naturalistic methods precludes anything spiritual. It precludes <clears throat> a creator. So if you limit when you're starting what you're going to include or accept, guess what your product will be? It will be atheistic. There's no God. Okay, let's dive into this. There are many things that are empirical proofs that disprove the theory of evolution, which is now the fundamental basis of most education around the world and supports the Bible. Let's start with the most proven laws in all of science. The boring first and second law of thermodynamics. Can anyone name the first law? Energy can be, cannot be created or destroyed by nature. That's right. Energy and matter cannot be destroyed or created 
but can be interchanged. Yeah. You can burn a match and it turns into Maybe heat and, and the other breakdown. Okay. What's the second law of thermodynamics? Law of entropy, everything performs. The way to go, man, that is right. Everything <laughs> runs down. Everything is getting old. Everything is becoming decrepit. Everything is going down. And to um, increase of entropy means it's, it's running out of gas, okay? These two laws actually require a creator. It's very simple. If you run backwards in time, our universe was more ordered. Okay, keep running back in time in your mind. Run back in time. There's a point where it cannot be more ordered. There's a point where it cannot be more ordered. That requires a creator. Just those two together. And those are the most proven of all science. In <clears throat> geology, when Darwin um, made his um, theory of the origin of species, 1857 or 9, I think, um, he said, well, we'll find the fossils to fill in the gap that they've never been found. And everyone to this day says that it's all local floods. When you go through Colorado, you go through and you see mountains, you go to Tennessee, you see all of the layers of, of um, limestone filled with fossils, okay? But they didn't know until now there are continuous layers from California to New England to Northern Canada. Singular layers, those are not local floods, my people. Those are massive continental wide flood sediments. There's no question they were laid down by water, okay? There are layers that start in New England, go into Greenland and into Europe. If you put the continents back together, South America into um, Africa, there are continuous layers that pass through South America to Africa. Same North America, Australia, um, Antarctica, and others, they were all together. There's no question this was a global flood, but there's rejection that keeps coming in the educational system. I'm so happy to hear about Christian schools because this is absolutely unjust lying indoctrination of children to teach that there is no God because evolution they say proves the origin of life this is very important I know you all know it but you've got to be armed with the actual facts well what about um, radiometric dating systems. What about carbon-14? Have you heard of that, carbon-12, carbon-14? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. What about uh, potassium argon? What about uranium lead? There's all of these radioactive, carb uh, radioactive dating systems. They are all untrustworthy. Yeah. Let me give you examples. The basis of these tests is we start with the radioactive element and then we wind up with the daughter element, and we can calculate how long it takes for them to break down, because there's a thing called half-life. Mm -hmm. Okay, well that sounds pretty straightforward, but nobody knows how many daughter elements were there before, which means that not all of them broke down, which would give a longer age than what is true. And they have found absolutely pure lead without any radioactivity from uranium. So that shows, well, you know, if this theory is true, there should be some there, but there's not. You need to know that fact. You also need to know that 
when something's submerged under water, it picks up more carbon-12 than it does carbon-14. The flood of Noah would have picked up more carbon-12 than carbon-14, skewing the record toward the long ages rather than the true age. Same thing with uh, all of the other tests. And when a certain rock is tested using different radiometric tests, they're wildly different. Well, which is true. What actually happens is that the geologists look at these wildly different ones and they just pick the one that fits their scenario. This is circular reasoning. <laughs> it fits their schematic. It fits their, it fits their geological record. Well, it must be here. So they date the, the layer by the fossils that are found in it, and they date the fossils by where the layer is. <laughs> so it's circular reasoning. Other rocks have been found where it's not a big rock. A small rock. This side of the rock gives a wildly different age than this side of the rock. Mm. Same rock. Mm. Go figure. Um, polonium 210 has a half um, life, well, I'm sorry, 218 has a half life of um, three months and um, the uh, 210 is three minutes. They're all over the world. Well, let me say this. Have you ever gone to a cemetery and looked at the real pretty um, uh, granite tombstones? <laughs> I mean, they're shiny, they polish them and everything. And you can look into those granite rocks and there's like crystals and you can see into them. They're really nice to look at. All granite, all over the world have these radiometric shells that have been generated. Some of them are, are from uh, uranium, some are from plutonium, and, but polonium is a very interesting one because the half-life is so fast. What happens is this little speck of radioactivity uh, over three minutes will cast off thousands, thousands of um, emissions beta and, and others uh, that will crash into a certain level of this granite and it makes a little shell a microscopic shell so they can look at these and say wow we know what that was because that was polonium 210 it was done in three minutes but wait a minute how in the world did that form in the middle of granite because if the granite is molten, it would be gone. Because if it's like lava, it's like molasses. It's not gonna be there. So that means that the granite had to be set up, congelled, hard. But yet these things are in the middle of it and it only took them three minutes to make that shell. A logical scientist would say, well, that means that it was instantaneously created. What, what, other, what other answer is there? And it's comical to watch scientists try to come up with answers to explain these things. All of these things are God's handiwork, God's fingerprint for us to learn from and to investigate and see his glory. It's amazing. But the world, of course, is rejecting all of this, okay? Uh, by the way, if you have questions, don't wait till the end. Just say, I got a question. Um, the most difficult thing against the Bible, which really says the world is only about 6,000 plus years old, versus evolution, which is, <clears throat> what 25 billion years now the universe and they've changed it down to 13 and then maybe it's more and now by the way i have a relative that works uh, had worked with the james webb telescope project as a, one of the um supervisors and it is throwing science on its ear right now because uh they're saying well this destroys the big bang theory 
first. You see all these things on the internet, on YouTube. And now they're saying, oh, this is before the Big Bang. <laughs> this is ridiculous. They don't know what they're talking about. And the more they talk, the more we know they're not, they don't know what they're talking about. So Starlight, what is the answer? Um, and this, you need to think about. Okay, if a galaxy is hundreds of billions of light years away, supposedly it takes hundreds of billions of years for the light to go from there to here. That's what redshift is all about. Okay, well, how do we answer that from the Bible? What do we say? Well, the Bible has the answer because on day four, it says God created the greater light, the sun, the lesser light, the moon, and he created the stars also. And in Job, it says the spirit of God decorated the heavens with the stars. Okay, let's think about that. Day four, that's only 24 hours, according to the Bible. Evening, morning, day four. Evening, morning, day three, day two, day, okay. Okay, well, how did that work? Well, if the Spirit of God is omnipresent, you could either say, well, he started here at the earth and went out in all directions <clears throat> from the earth. We're just supposing right now, okay. At the speed of light or faster, to the ends of the universe, wherever that is, decorated the skies, and came back at the speed of light. So how long did it take the Spirit to do that? What did Einstein say? He combined the space, time, matter, universe into mc squared. E equals mc squared. Which means that if you're going at the speed of light, there is no time. So <laughs> the spirit moving at the speed of light had no time at all to go out there and back. Kaboom, just like that. That's one way to explain how the light, because the light could have been created on the way. Oh, but Ken, you can't do that because <clears throat> that's fooling us. It has an appearance of long ages, and that is not right from a creator. That's not right from uh, the one who said that it's not old. Why would he make it so it appears to be old? So they have a way of criticizing. What is the answer? I ask you a question. When God made Adam, how old did he look? What do you think? About? 18. The, <laughs> <laughs> the perfect age of you, of you right? Yeah. Okay, yeah. 28? 28, yeah. Okay, he looked like he was 28. Was God deceiving us by making him look like he was 28 and he was really just created last minute mm. no he's not because his word tells us that's the difference there's no deception with God because he tells us I created Adam on day six boom so he looked like he was 28. To who? To God? No. Only to us. So when God tells us he made the sun, moon, and stars on day four, he did it. It only looks wrong to us. Now, scientifically, there's other explanations also that may key into this. There are some studies that have shown that it appears the speed of light is actually slowing down. The most recent studies sort of, you know, just claim that or are against that. But there are studies that show that possibly the speed of light is slowing down. Another thing is no one knows for sure how light propagates through the universe, through space, because Einstein predicted that the space is curved. Does light cut corners? The further out you are, the more corners it could cut. So there's, there's all of these things. We don't know all of the answers, but one thing I'm certain of is 
the billions and millions of, of uh, years that the atheist evolutionists are talking about is not true. Let's go on to other things. Um, fossils speak of stasis, which means no change, rather than change. Comparing fossils to living animals today, there's basically no change. Comparing fossils between fossils, there's no change, just like there's no change between animals today. So, and all of them are buried, which means death by water, sedimentary rock. But nobody talks about a global flood. Why is that? Oh, there's also tree fossils that go from one layer of um, clay or shale into coal, into shale, into coal, and into shale. Those are polystrata fossils. Now, wait a minute. You're telling me a tree was standing for millions of years for this shale to form, and then millions of years for coal to form, and then shale and coal and shale again? Are you kidding me? That's ridiculous. There's a mountain called Specimen Mountain right outside of Yellowstone. And this really threw me for a loop um, when I went as a young Christian in high school. I went there with my parents and there was a sign there. Look, right here is proof that the Bible is not true. <laughs> this is a buried forest. Look, here's a petrified tree and I saw it. And then there's an, another one in a different level and it goes up here and it keeps going up this ridge. And so it says, these are multiple forests that grew and died and were covered by volcanic ash. It shows eons and eons for that to happen. Would, don't you think that it would take a long time for a forest to grow and mature and then be buried by a volcano sediment and then another one later to grow and be buried and then another one? That would take way more than 6,000 years. So that basically disproves the Bible, right? I was worried about that for a long time until I found it in Specimen Creek Mountain near there they found some information that's very interesting. They have, I believe it's 26 or 28 separate layers of buried forest. 28 layers. But somebody got the bright idea, well, why don't we check the um, fossil tree rings? You know what they found? Fossil tree rings in the top layer matched fossil tree rings in the bottom layer. What does that mean? They're all buddies. <laughs> they, they grew at the same time. There's no way that... <laughs> so, so what does that mean? You Tell me what that means. They're all there at the same time. They were all dead at yeah. the same time. They all lived at the same time. They were all buried at the same time. That All 28 layers mm -hmm. were made at the same time. You go driving around the country and you pay attention, like in, I, I got off on a wrong road in Oklahoma and I went into Arkansas. What? And I stopped along the side of the road and I said, look at that. It was a cut and there was a big bulge in the layer. Well, how did that happen? There's no cracks. In Colorado, if you go over the Bighorn Mountains, have you ever gone over the Bighorn Mountains? On the eastern side, you can stop at a place where this strata is just bent like this. But there's no cracking, which means it was bent while it was still soft, which means that it was bent right after it was laid down which means that all of those layers were produced at the same time. So if you just pay attention, you can teach your kids, you can teach your friends, you can teach, hey, look at that. That doesn't make sense for evolution. It does make sense for the Bible. Very quickly, photosynthesis. Do you know that it's impossible? I mean, all of life depends on photosynthesis in the end. You cannot evolve
photosynthetic chemicals because the building blocks of photosynthesis are poisonous to all life. But yet they say, well, it was just a gradual buildup of, and finally the photosynthesis started working. No, it's impossible. Oxygen is necessary for all life, but oxygen will kill anything if it's in an oxygen um, environment or disintegrate it if you have like half a DNA strand. <laughs> you bring some oxygen in it, it's just gonna blow it all up. Oh yeah. You know, that oxygen. kind of stuff. It just it just blows Pure things oxygen? up. Yeah. Huh? Pure oxygen? Well, it oxidizes everything, uh, Oxi but, but yet life, need, all life needs oxygen. Right. So it's a conundrum or a paradox for evolution. We don't know how, but they keep pushing it back. They, they say, no, well, there's some other way. And this is fascinating. Do you know a lot of the scientists um, realized how awful their position is and they said well the answer is that there were mutations that changed things rapidly well there has not been proven one mutation that is helpful yet beyond a doubt but do you know that you 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 collect about 60 inheritable mutations every 25 years more or less so i'm i've got three of those <laughs> groups okay almost but these are inheritable now what does that mean you pass them on to your kids you know how long a dna strand is it is really long i mean microscopic molecules but it is long but 60 Inheritable mutations predicts what? A final generation. And there's no way around it. We are not evolving. We are devolving. If you want to talk science, we're devolving. There's going to be a final generation of all plant life, all animal life and all human life if the lord tarries <laughs> because it's headed in the wrong direction this is predicted and nobody wants to talk about this we should talk about it do you know that um the DNA. Could you just repeat what you said about the 60 inheritable mutations? I, I missed that part. Okay. There, um, in about every 25 years, mm -hmm. an average, mm -hmm. the human body is picking up about 60 mutations mm -hmm. that are inheritable. There are other mutations that are not inheritable. Right. Uh, and your DNA is fantastic because it'll go through and it'll try to erase the problems it has a mechanism that um, tries to self-correct okay but there's a net gain in every generation of inheritable mutations that are passed on mm -hmm. they're microscopic they're minute but they are building up so that's what geneticists have found but that's and, bad assuming that they're all bad mutations uh, but that's only a bad thing, assuming they're all bad mutations. Well, there, there are no proven good ones so far. Because a mutation, by definition, is a change mm -hmm. in the DNA mm -hmm. that is not according to what it was. Whatever changes the DNA, you know, like, um, what is it, uh, CRISPR and all of these things, you can splice and dice. DNA and you can substitute different things for experimentation and so on, but there's nothing to to enhance what God has created. Now we're not going to get into this, but let me just give you some food for thought. Viewing the flood of Noah, 
Genesis 6, 7, 8, 9, with the angel view, if you don't know what I'm talking about, look it up. But uh, if you follow the angel view, that is the reason why the flood came, because of genetic um, manipulation, genetic uh, breaking. Um, Jesus, when he was questioned about taxes, he said, well, show me a coin. He said, whose image is this? Oh, it's Caesar's. Okay, render to Caesar what's Caesar's. But he didn't stop there. What else did he say? And render to God what belongs to God. Okay, so that means Jesus thinks every human being should belong to God. But if you mix DNA, that's why this is so dangerous. If you mix DNA, you have what's called a chimera, which is a half this and a half that by forced genetic manipulation. It, especially with people, it mars the image of God because what God created is perfect. He was happy with it. But if you manipulate it into something else, it destroys God's image in people. So a lot of food for thought in this. Okay. I want to get get to this one. Uh, <laughs> um, chemically, under no circumstances, under any conditions, can molecules self-organize. Because evolution says, well, if we have enough time and we have enough um, places, anything can happen. No. That's not true. According to hard science, this will never happen. No matter what pressure, no matter what lighting situation, no matter what mix. Take, for example, um, a friend of yours. Put him in the blender and turn it on. Okay, you've got this friend that is now this goo. Well, you have all of the elements for life. Why doesn't something come out of it? It's the perfect mix. It's the highest mix. But sorry to say your friend is not going to make it. <laughs> Why? Because evolution is not true. <laughs> sorry for the bad impression. Okay. Pray a lot and get rid of it. Okay. <laughs> okay. Um, I would want to end with this one. Do you know what race mate means? <laughs> Racemization. I got it right. Racemization. This is an interesting thing. When you have chemicals, you know what it is? Yeah, it's same makeup, but with different orientation for a different unit. It's, it's called right handed and left handed molecules. You can have a bunch of atoms hooked together in a molecule. In the same way. And you've got one over here that maybe is the hydrogen or, or an oxygen. But guess what? Sometimes it's on this side. It's the same compound, not compound, it's the same. Um, yeah, it's the same. Except it could be here or it could be here. Do you know that all DNA is left handed molecules? And the cells in which it resides are all right handed. Don't tell me. It just happened. This is beyond amazing. All DNA is left-handed molecules. And all the rest of the cell is right-handed molecules. If you leave this in nature, they switch back to equality. 50% this way, 50% the other way. It's just, it's beyond uh, amazing. But science does not tell these things. Okay, I'm stopping. Questions? Okay, speak up. First, can you tell us how, um, tell us your, your background. So obviously you're a scientist. Can you tell everybody like uh, how you, 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 you also mentioned that you became a Christian in high school, but how did, like, how did this trajectory of your life head down towards this path where you were questioning a, yourself with science about God and stuff like that? Can you answer that? That, that is a great question because I was raised in church, but I love science. 
And science said this, evolution. Mm -hmm. But I was born again when I was a, a senior in high school. I go, wow, this is true. And I just started reading the Bible and I go, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. <laughs> this doesn't match. I know the Bible is true because I know Jesus saved me. I, I, it's the greatest thing that ever happened in my life. But I did not know how to answer these questions. And I became a missionary and, and went to Latin America. And I was in Panama with this unresolved question. I know the Bible's true, but I don't know how to answer this. And I love science. I picked up a little um, flyer uh, track by Dr. Dwayne Gish that says, have you been brainwashed? I started reading that. I go, wow, polystrata fossil. Wow. Oh, this, that. It was like right away, it gave me the answers I was looking for. Then I started picking up fossils all over Latin America, especially in Bolivia, the mountains of uh, the uh, Andes. And um, it's gone from there. And more recently, I, I wanted to show you this. Um, evolution, the death of critical thinking. And that's the truth, man. They kill themselves on critical thinking. Because if you follow critical thinking, you won't be an evolutionist. 95 theses criti criti critiquing the theory of evolution. I produced this, and I want you to look at these pictures. I put this on the door of the science building at UC Berkeley <laughs> on the 500th anniversary of Martin Luther's posting of his 95 thesis on the Wittenberg Hall in <laughs> Germany. That was in uh, October 31st, 2017. And today, no one still answered me. All of them are purely scientific, disproving evolution, supporting the Bible, None of them are biblical. Mm -hmm. I have other intro stuff. I have uh, a critique at the end of the most vicious attack against creation science, uh, answer all of the questions, and so on. But in the middle are the 95 points. And there are so many, it's beyond 95. I had to make A, B, C, D, E, F on, on some of them. So that's how I came here. And it's just fascinating to me that, but let me just say this, the reason I'm interested in this, your faith is weak if you do not really believe the first chapter of the Bible. Because if you don't believe really the first chapter of the Bible, how can you believe in the resurrection of Jesus Christ and the eternal judgment and eternal life? How can you believe if, you, if there are errors on the first page of the Bible? How can you believe the rest of it? Are you kidding me? It is true all the way god's the author we just don't know how to explain it we've got to start talking you know when you have babies use your words use your words we've got to use our words we've got to tell people using science creation evangelism just to get them to a point i better seriously read the bible because they won't mm -hmm. it's a done deal in people's minds well you guys maybe you're good counselors maybe you're good at this maybe you have a nice family relationship maybe you like, yeah maybe i'll go to church oh, i don't know but it's just not true to them and we don't realize it that the world of the united states has changed right it has changed from when i grew up mm -hmm. and i got hit by it mm -hmm. so you you've got to be a creation evangelist to convince these people. They went hard back, well, we've got them. That's a good name, I never heard that. Like, creation what? A creation, uh, this girl has a question. Yeah. Um, so I like um, attended like um, conferences and stuff, but they also talked about um, science versus creation. And someone brought up like carbon 12, carbon 14 dating and how it, said like the earth was like millions and billions of years old and the I just wanted to know your opinion of like the that speaker's answer because he instead of um taking it your route he agreed with the carbon 
dating, but instead when he read the first chapter of the, or first chapter of Genesis, he talks about how um, the, like, day one, day two, like, it's not the 24 hours that we think of because each day, like, up until, like, the fourth day or something, like, morning and, like, morning and evening had yet to be established. And so the first, like, four days could have been, like, billions of years for all we know. It was just, like, how it was written because up until then, there was no true, like, 24 hour, this, like, mm. sun, like, or the earth revolves around that turns. Great question. <laughs> when, look at history on how this happened. Darwin, 1857, and then Europe ac accepted this in the universities and it came to the United States. And there was a Scopes trial in Tennessee in uh, 1920. And creationists, the people who believe in the Bible, won the court case, but the whole country turned against the Bible because it was publicized and it was uh, taken into the media that people who believe in the Bible are old thinking people, they don't know science. And, and at that time, the Bible believing people didn't even know how to answer. And this was such a powerful hit against the church mm. that the church developed two false theories. Mm. One of them is the day-age theory that you're talking about. You know, the days are really not days, they're billions of years or millions Compromised. of years. <laughs> the other one is the gap theory, which says, well, it says, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth, but then there's a gap of time that we don't know about because over in uh, Isaiah, it says, God did not create the earth void. And it said it's void. Wait a minute. God wasn't done creating. Don't criticize him before the first day is over because that's what's happening. They're sitting in judgment of God's word because God actually has a perfect word. Now, I'm going to answer your question. I'm getting there. The um, gap theory was made because at that time they thought, well, dinosaurs, we don't have any in the world, so that must have been a different world. So there must have been pre-Adamites that Satan ruled, and then Satan fell, and then uh, God started over after that judgment. And he started over with Adam and Eve. First of all, there's theological problems. God doesn't make a mistake. He doesn't do this, and then he starts over because he has kept Noah and is still working with the same people all the way through. He's committed. So the, that theory is totally false because we now, now we know that alligators and other things and large lizards uh, continue to grow. Most reptiles continue to grow as long as they live. So if uh, the pre-flood people from Adam and Eve live nearly a thousand years. I guess our noses keep growing as long as we're old and have long noses, I guess. But I don't know. <laughs> anyway, these lizards would have been monsters. That's helping with the understanding. But when the flood happened, they were probably on the ark as juvenile dinosaurs and released after the flood as well. But we have a statement in um, Genesis uh, chapter 10 about Nimrod, who is, was a mighty, no, not 10, um, I think it's uh, maybe 10 or 11. Anyway, Nimrod was a mighty hunter before the, God, before the Lord, which he didn't get that nickname by hunting turkeys. <laughs> so, so. That theory is out the window. Now, the day-age theory is a little more tricky because, first of all, in the Bible, in uh, 2 Peter 3, it says, one day is like a thousand years, and a thousand years is one day. But the um, patience for the Lord's coming, don't give up because that, okay? But he's, he's not willing that any should perish. Okay, take that in context. That does not mean that a thousand years is one day or one day is a thousand years. It does not mean that. Go to the Ten Commandments. Biblically, there's support for 
a 24 hour day in the Ten Commandments because it says after the Ten Commandments, uh, and it's in twice, it's re in, in uh, Exodus and then in uh, Deuteronomy, mm -hmm. it says, For the Lord your God made the heavens and earth in seven days. That's why you're supposed to worship on the Sabbath. Okay? That is not a, an allegory. That's not a parable. That's not a, a poetic idea. It's literal. The real thing is they can't figure out how plants could have lived for billions or millions of years without the sun and star and moon, which give light on day four. Okay? So they throw the baby out with the bathwater because they can't re re have a resolution of this. The clearest example, the writer of Genesis is who? The Holy Spirit given to Adam. I believe that met up to chapter 12 has been given to Moses in documents. Because if you look carefully, it'll say, this is the generation of so-and-so. This is the generation of Jacob. This is the generation. And so it's like a packet of information that was passed down through the flood to the godly people. And they recorded it, and Moses edited it, but he didn't write all of this out of his head yeah. as a prophet. He could have, um, because prophecy is sure, but I don't think that's what happened. It is from the Lord himself. So there's no clearer way to express to all the world than to say, evening, morning, one day. There, there's no other way to interpret that. Are you going to say a billion evenings and a billion mornings one day? No. It's one evening and one morning, one day. And it does that all the way through. All the way through. If you notice, uh, let me just say this. What appears in the first chapter ten times? While you're thinking, I'm going to say... It is good. Ten, huh? It is good. And what? it was good. And it was good. After God No, and it happens seven times. There's one day that misses it and two days that have two. Yeah. Okay. But what is Oops. the uh, ten thing? I'm, I'm going to speak of some. Ten is a number of judgment. There's ten commandments and we failed. All of us have failed, right? There were ten plagues in Egypt. There were ten virgins. Five had enough oil and five didn't. <laughs> There were 10 lepers, only one turned back and said, thank you, God. 10, guess what? Laban changed Jacob's wages 10 times. <laughs> okay, what's in the first chapter of Genesis 10 times? Okay, they will reproduce according to their kind. That is mentioned 10 times. That is a genetic command and proclamation and truth. So when people are messing with DNA, watch out, people, watch out. Because God made it so, according to the kindness, from the beginning. No chimeras. Out. <laughs> okay, questions. Any burning questions? We gotta do some rapid fire questions because it's almost time. Burning questions for Ken. Wait, so you said like God would never make this is one thing I was kinda of wondering. Like, so you said God never made a mistake, but then when he like for during the Noah's like whole story, he like restarted, like factory reset Earth because he like flooded the entire Earth. So what was the mistake? Right, why well a bigger question that fits with that is why was God so angry, apparently, in the Old Testament? It looks like there's a different God. Why did he command Joshua to go in there and kill everybody? Okay. All of these hang together, actually. And it has more to do with genetics than what we have recognized. If you look at what God says to Noah. He said, Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. That means he was looking for it, right? But God says, I have found you 
and this is what the original says, <clears throat> pure in your generations. But usually the Bible says uh, perfect or righteous among your people at your, in your uh, generation. That's not all the meaning that's there. You're pure in your genealogy. Think about that. Because if the angel view is true, mm -hmm. then fallen angels had children by human women, and the offspring were the Nephilim, mm -hmm. the walking dead, mm. the giants of old, the men of renown. The, and, the, and it says, the, uh, God says, the whole world has become corrupt in my eyes. Mm -hmm. God's eyes see the DNA. Mixing humankind with another kind, they're no longer human. They're part human. And that is a very awful situation to be in because you're not fully human, you're half human. So if you're half human, God says, I, I can't go on with this. You are not the human that the image of God. God's Another kind God. of living, uh, living thing. So, yeah. so if you have this context, it is an actual mercy of God that he wiped the others away to save us, the human race. Wow. Well, which will prevent more Nephilim yeah. in the burning pits of fire. Oh, true, true, that's true. Okay, that makes sense. So, it's the same God, Old Testament and New Testament. And that's why Joshua was commanded what he was commanded. And David finally wiped out the last of the giants. Oh, okay. Right? Hmm. Okay. Yep. But what did Jesus say? As in the days of Noah, so will be the coming of the Son of Man. Ah, yeah, 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 yeah. What are we going to face? Get ready. Think about these things. Amen. Prepare. Mm -hmm. I had, uh, uh, I've heard this argument for the... Your mic's not on. Oh, sorry. Okay, there you go. <laughs> I've heard this argument against a worldwide flood, and I was wondering what your answer would be of... Uh, what happened to all the freshwater fish during the worldwide flood? Because like they wouldn't be yeah. able to survive in brackish water, right? Yeah, that's a great question. There are, are uh, different species that are in brackish and that can go back and forth. But the um, the real question is what happened to the fresh fish, freshwater fish? The um, oceans before the flood were definitely less salty than they are now, because, uh, for example, in the Mediterranean Sea. If you go down just about 10 foot um, under the, the sediments that are at the bottom of that sea, which is a very shallow sea in most places, there's a layer of salt. Now, evolutionists will say, well, that, that says that Gibraltar was cut off and that it dried up and that all of this salt got deposited there. And then yeah, there were other sediments come in and then it broke out and then it covered it up and that salt never got into the ocean. But actually there are chemical reactions where hyper, uh, what do they call it? Superheated uh, materials coming out of the earth, hitting cold water can condense salt layers on the bottom of the ocean and also calcium layers, which is amazing to me, and then they were covered. So that salt is not in the ocean and probably never was in the ocean, but we know the rates of salt going into the ocean, like the Colorado River is a very salty river. It's one of the saltiest you know, for irrigation in the country. Uh, other rivers are way, way less salt. So there's a heavy payload. There, there is more than a train load of salt going into the Salton Sea every day from the irrigation water that is being used in California from the Colorado River. 
So you can just imagine how much salt is going into the ocean every day. So there is a huge ability in DNA for adaptation to environment. The adaptation is not evolution. It is adapting to where you are. So that's part of the answer. And the other part of the answer is it was way less salty at that time. A third answer is in hydrological studies, when they have studied large floods and large interactions of water, there can be huge pockets of water that continue to exist for a long, long time. My studies showed that the early part of the flood was very, um, if you could say, uh, non-catastrophic. It, it was very gentle <laughs> until you hit day 150, and, or right before 150 in the, the flood, because wham, something happened right before there that caused mountains to rise under the oceans and, and all of these things happening. So a gentle, non-convulsive flood, if you will, for a period of time, could have easily hosted large bodies of fresh water without mixing. If you see some of these YouTubes, you can see the freshwater lenses over salt water mm -hmm. at river mouths. And you know that the ocean water can go upstream in large rivers like six miles because it like rolls it and it goes right upstream. So, but it, it doesn't really mix that much. It, it stays pretty separate because of the weight densities. So this, the freshwater isn't too much of a problem for freshwater fish. They would have stayed there because there's a density difference. Cool. Well, Brad, uh, study the uh, biology you talked about like deep ocean have the fish and all this that like, uh, do not need lights. Mm. And then they also uh, do not need oxygen. And so they can using, I don't know how that, I forgot about all these details in this. Anaerobic bacteria. Yeah, kind of like, um, you know, the mouse and all this, like uh, they really break down nitrogen instead of using oxygen to. There, okay, there. So, but yeah. can, I'm just curiosity about like the deep ocean, right? All the fish down there, and it's really different from the fish on the, like, uh, on the top of the sea. So can you talk about that? You know what my question is, right? Yeah. The, so it's related to evolution in a sense. Mm -hmm. So they are no eyes, they don't need eyes and all this stuff and all this. And then they have their own system, the way how to sensors and all this stuff that um, you know, I remember when I studied. Yeah, and those are great questions because there are organisms that are, well, I think they're called antibiotic that um, do not, uh, need oxygen mm -hmm. to live, but they need oxygen in their system to live. They, they don't, um, like for example, trees breathe in and need CO2, mm -hmm. but they break it down into photosynthesis and then give off uh, oxygen and uh, carbon, or use the carbon. So there are organisms, God created them, it's not evolutionary at all, they were designed to do that, and they're in their um, environment that God designed them for. And the um, low oxygen, is, he designed certain, like uh, the seven gill shark, very deep ocean, um, they're, they're made for it. And there's no light at all. They just smell and feel their way around, and there's all kinds of, of stuff done. It, it's, a, it's a marvel, but they're, they're, I don't see any conflict at all in, in um, God's creation because we discover these kinds of things. Um, they're, they're made for a particular environment, and they're separate. They're not... Uh, Darwin had this family tree, of how, and he says, I think. <laughs> He had no idea. He had no idea about DNA. He had no idea. He just, I think this is happening. That's not happening. <laughs>